Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former Smoky Mountain Wrestling TV champion, a former WCW World Tag Team champion. He's, of course, Scotty Riggs. Yeah, look at the belt right behind him. Yes, Mr. Scotty Riggs. Scotty, welcome to the two-man power trip. How you doing? What's up, Paz? How you doing, brother? Doing good. I can't believe you're a Cowboys fan, but uh, that's okay, I guess. Dun, dun, dun. Nice, yes. brother. I've been a Cowboys fan since I want to say at least around 1975. When I first oh. started playing football, it was around the same year, about 74, 75. And born and raised in Georgia, the the first game was always Falcons against somebody, or uh, maybe Miami, some other team around the southeast some Florida team playing somebody. And then the second game, the four o'clock window was always the Cowboys against Washington or New York. Cause they were East coast teams or Philly. So at least once every two weeks or so we got to see the Cowboys play and just fell in love with that star. Roger Staubach, the doomsday defense, Bob Brunig, Randy, the Manster White, those names, those guys Ed two tall Jones. I mean, it was just a time that, they had me hooked when I saw the star and I saw Tom Landry with the fedora on. Got me hooked, brother. Too bad uh, they stink today. Too bad. Say again? Too bad they stink now, even though they really don't this year, but they've been pretty bad. Well, don't everybody says that, and I always go, well, they might not be doing a lot today or at least the past 25 years. They've been the 800, 8 and 18, maybe – Seven and nine, yeah, they they really suck. But hey, at least we have five Super Bowl trophies. I'd rather have a history than a, what have you done? Oh, we got one Super Bowl. Been there twice. What you do before that? Oh, we sucked. What you doing now? Uh, not much. We, we always go to playoffs, though. Well, I still have five Super Bowl trophies in my trophy case. Not mine, but you know what I'm saying. The Cowboys still have five in their trophy case. Then you got Steelers, and then you got Tom uh, Tom Brady. <laughs> yes. So Tom Brady's beating everybody. So that's cool, though. What are you up to today? What's what's going on in your world? Pretty much just enjoying a retired life, man. Live on the beach, just chilling. Uh, I had my time when I was a wild guy, and you know, doing the. The American Males, doing the flock, doing the, you know, USWA Memphis. I lived on the road, you know, seven days a week. You were somewhere, you were at least in Memphis two days out of the week. Every other night, you were either in, in Louisville or Evansville or somewhere else along the way, traveling, wrestling every day on the road. So I did that for a while, you know. So I pretty much lived that life. And I've never really been a crowd person anyway. So as weird as that sounds for a pro wrestler, you know, just the crowds have not been around crowds and stuff. There's always going to be in the ring where you're kind of separated from the audience and you can like feed off their energy, but to really be in a mix of crowds, it's really not my thing. So um, I've only done a few conventions along the way just to get crowded sometimes. It's like, uh, this is cool. This is fun, but it's just not my entire thing anymore. I'm an old when fart. When people see you at conventions, do they talk American males? Do they talk to the flock? What do they mention to you like the most? Eh, it's it's a good mix. I mean, mainly, I would say mainly American males. Um, it's hard to forget the theme song. Uh, everyone says we should have better, a better push. We were a great tag team. They liked our work together. Me and Marcus, we had really great chemistry. For guys who kind of knew each other but didn't know each other, when they put us together, I'd come in from, I was in Memphis uh, on a Wednesday. I'd gotten, okay, it was a Tuesday in Louisville. They've been calling me, uh, Kevin Sullivan through Jenny Ingle, who was the secretary, had been calling every Tuesday because we were in Evansville on Tuesday, or Louisville on Tuesday. So it was actually Wednesday mornings I would get a phone call in my room. I guess they knew that from Jimmy Hart or whatever in the office. So they're days in Louisville, Kentucky, blah, 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 blah. And so they called there, got my room. And long story short, I remember that 
Wednesday before Evansville, I got in touch with Janie, or she called me and said, we need you in Orlando next Monday for TV tapings for two weeks. We're going to put you and Marcus together, be a 90-day trial, to see if y'all work together, see how things happen. And pretty much, I just want to say that night, drove to Evansville. Pulled Randy Hale, who was the promoter, the booker, the whatever you want to call him. He was the head guy there. The their their uh I guess he, you know, he helped put shows together and everything. But long story short, he was there. I walked up to him and said, Hey man, I gotta to talk to you real quick. Um, I'm leaving tonight to go to Atlanta, because I gotta be in Atlanta to do uh for starting with WCW on Monday. And I gotta get together a bag well to put stuff together, and da 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 da. He's like, What? And of course, they were mad because they want you to be there for two weeks before you leave. And just dealt with that. And the next thing I know, me and Bagwell were together. Um, we put some uh, some outfits to jeans with some sequins on the side. Marcus went out and bought these shirts, sleeveless, like jean type shirts, and put American Bells in the back. We went out and bought boots to have for wrestling tights, actually, cowboy boots, got the soles cut off the bottom, put the wrestling crepe the soul on there and that monday without really anything worked out we had a we had our first match was against regal and bobby eaton the blue bloods and you talk about a pressure cooker of a tryout match in a sense to see if we'd work together me and marcus didn't have any type of you know double moves or this that or the other we came up with a double drop kick for the finish and the next thing we know, we just got in the ring and just clicked. It was just bing, bang, boom. And it happened. We just all of a sudden kind of just had a little chemistry where I knew kind of what he was looking for. Make a tag. I don't have to say one thing. I knew on a tag, the guy has his hand out for the hot tag. He keeps it steady. I go for, I, I, I'm the one who makes the reach. So I knew that. So Marcus said that send up to me. In one sense, it was like we just, I just knew how to do tag team wrestling just as much as did singles wrestling at the time. And it worked. And so I guess fans always remembered, I guess, the vibe we had. And they just remember that better because, again, again, come back to that damn song. Um, oh, yeah. I just think that that clicks with everybody more than anything else. Then I patched with the flock. Everybody asked if I still have it. No. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> I went through about, uh, Probably three or four dozen of those along the way because I always go to CVS and get them. They maybe last a show or two or a couple shows. I throw them in a the bag. They didn't get trashed somewhere by the ring or or ever, you know, in a match. And so, but but most of the time it's just that they don't talk about the the mirror thing. Thank God, that was not my idea. I hated doing it, but it was just something they I kind of came up with because they didn't want me. Uh, I didn't get my wish to kind of keep the eye patch. And the only other thing to do keep on they do ask about is the uh the ecw doing the clap gimmick so anything i guess involving the clap yes however you want to take that is how i'm how they uh fans interact with me either on twitter or wherever else i do things that's mainly the questions i kind of get what did you think of the american males just in general because it seems like a very 80s gimmick in the mid nineties, what did you think about the American males gimmick? I mean, it was, it was, um, it was very much a mix of the fantastics, the fabulous ones. Yep. Um, it's like we did a music video. We, well, it really wasn't a music video, but we shot some video and did some, uh, photo stills, uh, on horses in Orlando after that blue buzz match where again, everything clicked eating and regal, made me look like a 10-year veteran in the match. They were calling all kinds of spots to make me look good. And so, like, the very next day or it was the day after, um, they took us out, put us on horses and stuff like that. And it was all a Jimmy Hart mentality. Jimmy saw, when he, you know, when, when he saw us together, when he saw a video of us beforehand that we, we had shot, he... Um, he, it clicked in his mind for him, me and him to tag because Marcus was talent, tagging with, I think, I want to say Alex Wright at the time. And they were trying to do a German American connection type thing, and it just really wasn't working. 
and that's when they were looking for somebody to tag with Marcus, and I was the one who kind of came across. And and so it definitely was a Jimmy Hart mentality, definitely 80s white bread playing Jane almost baby face tag team is what we were. And for the longest time, we were the only good guy tag team they had. They had, you know, the nasty boys. You could go back and forth depending on who they're wrestling. Dick Slater and Buckhouse Buck, Harlem Heat, State Patrol. I'm trying to even think about who else. You know, the Armstrongs were a great tag team. Uh, Scott and Steve that they had working together. Uh, they were a true babyface tag team, but they knew how to work and could. When we wrestled them, they worked heel against us, even though they really didn't cheat. They kind of did. And so we were the only ones that didn't really, you know, get a chance to be bad guys. I think if, we, if they would have started off the good guy thing, maybe put the straps on us like they did, gave us a little rub. And then we could have just, because every time we go out, we'd hear these high-pitched girls cheering for us. Oh, yeah. And then it'd be the guys didn't like us because we were threats to their, you know, losing us to their girlfriend type thing is the way we were viewed. So just long story short, the only time we actually worked heel was a Saturday night TV taping. Uh, we were supposed to work with Dick, uh, with Slater and Buckhouse Buck, had Colonel Parker with him. And Buck went, couldn't make it for some reason. He did, he would either no showed or something's going on, missed his flight, whatever reason he wasn't there. So Slater came out and um we worked a, a two-on-one match with him where basically we were like double teaming him and he started firing back on us like a baby face. We were double teaming him, bang, 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 all these little spots. And he started, we were, he was standing in the middle of the ring. I can remember, I can picture it. And he's just bam, bam, bam. We're feeding him left, right, slam, elbow, slam, elbow, punch, punch. And we're just bouncing, 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 bouncing. And the fans are actually starting to cheer for Buck and he's starting to get tired get winded and he just falls back to the ropes and falls to the floor. <laughs> Colonel Parker picks him up, puts him in the ring. And um, I'm trying to remember, we help him in. We actually shake his hand. We raise his hands in the middle of the ring for putting a great fight. We turn around, we double punched him in the gut, <laughs> nice. double punched him again, shot him off with a double drop kick. We both popped up. Yeah. Like that. And the, the fans, I think we were in Gainesville of all places, right outside of Atlanta, Gainesville, Georgia, the mountain center there. Dove in on the cover, one, two, three. We popped up. I'm like, we both went, man, if this don't get us a chance to be healed, don't know what will. Next week, that, it acted like nothing like that happened. It was just a match. No big deal. We were like, dude, we could go heal on here. Nah, we need a baby face tag team. We got Steiners in here now. You got, you know, uh, Lex and Sting were together then. Um, they were, I think they were tag camps too at the time. So I'm like, dude, you were, we, we talked to them, but they just didn't want to turn us. So, and I think that's when he started sometime after that is when he started to, they were trying to tell the story that when one of us was going to turn on the other, we started doing the fumbling, bumbling stuff. The Quebecers came in, Rujo and, um, the other cat can't remember his name. PCO. Yeah. Um, but, all these other teams have started to come in public enemy. And so we kind of look, got lost in the shuffle a little bit, but they were trying to keep us in the mix by telling us a little, what's going to combust out of the American males, who's going to do what. And then the NWO thing happened. So, but yeah, I think, I mean, we were like, you know, like you said, we were such an eighties tag team in the mid nineties. What did you really think about the theme song? Were you into it? Were you bobbing your head to it or did you hate it? Um, <laughs> The first time Jimmy pulled it out on us was at that tape in Orlando. I'm trying to remember exactly. Jimmy pops up. He's got, I think he had a disc player. He pops it in there and, you know, it starts off with that. Neow, neow, da -na 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 -na. I mean, Marcus is going, hey, this ain't bad. It's, you know, it's got a good beat. And all of a sudden you hear the American male. And, and Jimmy's going, listen to it, baby. Listen to it, baby. It's got the little Devo sound, you know. We're, me and Mark just looked at each like. I remember we, we both bug eyed and looked at each other, and went, <laughs> "Okay, <laughs> we can make it work." Because I, mean, I know Marcus, when he teamed with uh, Too Cold, 
it was too cold's music when he teamed with patriot it's patriots music yep. they kind of had his own music but it was generic when he was by himself and i don't know who they they probably used alex music for when they put him and alex together so he never had his own music and me i was using um when i was in memphis i was using new jet stranglehold to come out to and so I never really had my own music either. So as a tag team to have a tune, it's like, hey, we, we'll make it work, you know? And it was just, it was the cheesiest thing in the world, but we made it work. People knew, they identified it with us. And again, the crazy thing is 25 years later, 26 years later, whatever, we're in 2021 now, um, it's, people still know it. it. It still gets stuck in your head when you hear it. So... It stood the test of time. It wasn't easy being cheesy. We'd always said that line. We're sitting there doing the forum. It ain't easy yep. being cheesy, brother. And but it worked. I love that song. You're right, though. Though the background you does either sound love it good, or you yep, hate or, it. Yep, I love there it. Ain't no middle ground on it, you know. And that is true with the song. It does sound good, and then it, all of a sudden he starts saying "American males," and that's where you lose it a little bit, you know. That when it when it kicks the Devo. Ugh. Very, I don't know, weird song, especially for that time period. But it, it's so memorable. Everybody remembers that song. Well, I mean, when if you think about it, I don't know. I think, I'm not sure, but I think uh, Michael Hayes was doing some of the music before that. So when you got Sting come out to a man they call Sting, he does this, he does that. He's strong as a bull and he's fast as a cat. He looks fine. He looks cool. Okay, the American Males is not that bad compared to Sting's song. We got <laughs> Steiner Eyes, you know. When, when you got those other tunes that are out there in the mix, you kind of go, the American Males weren't that bad when it, when, compared to the other cats. So, again, deal with it. It's cool. Were you guys happy with where you were on, like, on the card? Were you happy at, at, like when you first get on there? Because you're getting pretty good TV time. Well, again, we were the only babyface tag team they had. So we pretty much made, uh, when, I, when we started again, I was on a 90 day trial uh, to be, see if me and Bagwell worked. Um, and we were on every, we were on the first night show in Minneapolis. We were a dark match. We did like 25 minutes with Dick and Buck. Um, That's a dark match on the show, something like that, 20 minutes, somewhere around there. Um, and then we were on every TV after that, uh, every Nitro. Um, they put the straps on us, which was cool. Um, we started doing all the tours. We, like we went to Germany. Uh, we went to an England tour, I think it was. And we were just on every house or every other house show. It seemed like every weekend we'd have one weekend. Where we, you know, we do a, a loop around the weekend Finish Nitro, do a Saturday night taping on Tuesday. Uh, was home on Wednesday. Maybe the next weekend we had off. And then we'd be back on Nitro on Monday. Um, or if they had a pay-per-view Sunday, we'd be in a dark match on the pay-per-view or something like that. Like uh, the first pay-per-view we did was um, WCW versus New Japan. I think, I think it was Super Brawl or something like that. Whatever the pay-per-view was, it was WCW versus New Japan. Starcade 95. Thank you. Um, was it Starcade? When they had the, 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 the cup? Yeah. Okay. So, um, my, I'm, I can remember we were in Nashville, <laughs> and we were at the Blue Bloods, of all people. We had New Japan versus WCW. First, oh, The first match, I think we were, was uh, the American Males versus uh, the Blue Bloods. Made no sense, and once you could have brought had a Japanese tag team in there for us, but now right. we'll put them against the Blue Buds. That way, it's country versus country, I guess. And um, but yeah, we were on everything, and yeah, it was good. Um, we were definitely uh, formulated into the show, and so whether it was win, lose, or draw, you we were part of the you know we were part of the team. So and that was the most important thing back then. Because there are a lot of guys that would show up at TVs and not work and sit there for hours because they couldn't leave and have to make the trips, not do anything, got paid whatever they got paid, and then go home and have nothing to really show for it. At least I knew it was going to be on TV that next week. 
my mom and dad had this huge VHS uh, collection where my dad taped all the matches. So it was probably about uh, a good hundred uh, VHS tapes. So it was it was definitely good to be part of the team because we were on everything. What did you think about actually winning the tag titles over Harlem Heat? I was shocked. I remember as a fan, like, wow, because that was a huge upset at the time. I mean, Harlem Heat were the kings of the division. Well, if you look at it, I'm trying to think when things aired um, in building us. I think the first time they really saw us was, I'm trying to think it was a syndicated show or what. But the first time they really saw us was at the uh, main event before Fall Brawl. We worked the Nasty Boys. And what it was supposed to be was us the next night against um, Regal and Eaton uh, for a number one contenders match. And of course, we went over on the Nasties, and they didn't want to put us over. You know, who's this new team coming in there? Who's this guy with Bagwell? Who's the biggest thing? And if you ever watch the match back, you'll see Nobs, not Nobs, but Sags lock up with me, shove me into the corner. And hit me with 22 unanswered punches and kicks, live rounds. You see Nat, you see Nobs run over to the side, give his partner a shove. What are you doing? What are you doing? Bagwell pops in the ring. I think Randy Anderson's the referee. And they're all going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Stop that shit, you know? And Sag just goes, I'm just welcoming him to the company. <laughs> and I'm a youngster, you know, I'm on yeah. making no money on a 9 8 trial, trying to really not make waves to kind of take care of myself. But, you know, but what do you do at, at the moment? Take it, fire back a little bit. And, but that whole, that, that night is when, that afternoon is when they told us on Monday they were going to put tax traps on us. And I was kind of like, wow. And Marcus, Marcus was like, this is good. This is good. And um, the Nasties kept trying to mess with me and kept saying, oh, they've changed the finish. Da, da, da. To me, I'm like, hey, I'm just here. If they really, they tried to rib me all day at the, <laughs> the pay-per-view. And the worst part was the night before, we actually had a finish meeting that Saturday night because of what the Honky Talk Man did about not wanting to put Johnny B. Bad over. So we had a finish meeting. And after that, Flair took me, Marcus, and two of the office girls, Kelly and Yvonne, who are two of the coolest girls you've ever met. I mean, they were, they've been in the office for probably a couple of years and they've gotten no Rick and everything else. Nobody messing around on that stuff, but they were just two of the coolest people you ever met. They were on every promotional thing we did. And they showed up every night to every pay-per-view to party, hang out, be with the boys, and just be, you know, be the part of the boys. And he took us out and got us hammered. So the next morning we wake up, we go out to go work out, get get pumped going, get sweat out the alcohol he had poured in us. And that was Flair welcoming me to the company, which was a blast. But that next night, lined up with the nasty boys, knew that was gonna be rough. Yep. Like I said, the 22 answered up under pensions and kicks and battling a hangover. The nasty boys messing with me, ribbing me about that, that, you know, we're not winning tiles. We're going over. I really, again, I didn't care. I was like, cool. Don't matter to me. And they were, they were mad. I didn't get phased. They thought I'd be bitching and moaning. I didn't care. I was just happy to be there to, at the moment. And then that next night, um, so when they jump, uh, Eaton beat him up. Come in the ring, say they put tag straps on. So nobody was expecting that match. It was definitely not advertised. It was not promoted. Nothing. It was American Males with Blue Buds. I think it's what they even put on the screen leading to it. I can't remember. But, um, but yeah, that upset finish, the crowd was 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 wild. The energy was nuts. I, was, I remember jumping up and down because I'm like going. I do remember I got to the back and I had a look, some tears in my eyes. Because I just left Memphis, was there for eight months, made less than six grand in the eight months I was there, put about 70,000 miles in my truck, and had come to, come to WCW 
with nothing in my pocket. I was sleeping on Ray Lloyd Glacier. I was sleeping on his couch, actually, at the time, because I didn't have anywhere to stay because it won't make any money yet. And so I have a little bit of tears in my eyes, and Arn Anderson walked by and was like, dude, you all right? I'm like, dude, you don't know where I just came from to be here, and I got this this strap in my hand that everybody from Dr. Death, Steve Williams, and um, Terry Gordy had held, you know, the blondes had held, you know, Heat, those guys, the, the actual straps that these guys had worn, you know, you know, uh, the in-ring worn belts, all these guys, their blood, sweat, and tears have actually touched. It was in my hands at the time. So, you know, that's kind of romantic way of thinking about it, but that's part of the romance of wrestling is who held that actual strap before you. And uh, and it, it to me, it was funny. It was kind of um, a little bit of good karma. The R was one of the first guys I, I saw after we won the straps. And I was just sitting there in the, in the corner because he was the guy who told me to get out of WCW back in 94. He goes, because he, he, he pulled me aside at center stage one night and told me, he goes, you're a good looking kid. You got a great attitude, great work. He goes, you, you just need to sharpen your skills, but you need to get out of here because Eric Bischoff's about to take over. And you will get stuck in the ceiling and never get a chance to, to grow. It's like, okay. And that's when I was traveling with Jake the Snake at the time. We did a Thanksgiving show in, I want to say either Macon, Georgia, or somewhere below Macon, Georgia. And Jerry Lawler was on it. And that's when Jake put me over the Lawler. Lawler watched the match. Came up the, to me afterwards and said, hey, would you want to come to Memphis? Said, you'll make... 40 bucks, a day, 40 bucks a day, but you wrestle six nights a week, twice on Saturday with TV in the morning. He goes, you won't make any money, but you'll get experience and you'll get exposure. He goes, and that's what, what from what Jake says, and uh, that's what you need. I said, cool, yeah, definitely. He goes, well, around January 1st, we'll get in touch with you and give you a start date. Cool beans. Then, and again, January 1st came up, uh, got a call. And it was uh, Randy Hale who was booking again. Said so your starting dates January fourteenth. So it was Arn telling me to get out of there. That got me ready for the eight months I was in Memphis to come in. And then after about, well, I guess it was four, three four weeks of actually being with the company, they had the tax taps put on me. And then to see Arn, it was like you know. So to me, it was like very very cool. But again, I, I didn't know how to be a champion yet. Because when you get that first title on you, okay, I kind I know I've watched guys be champion before, but I've never been a champion before, especially with a big time company. So I still had a learning curve to go with it. I think that's why I wish our, our run would have been a little bit longer. But, you know, we, we had gotten, again, be put on everything, got, uh, you know, at least got to wear the straps. And Pretty the awesome. little replica I got yep. ab above me there. Mm. Trying to see where my camera angle is here. Yep. But um, I'm nowhere near pointing at it. That thing. I got that from doing a uh, a DVD set with... Um, now I can't even think of who did it with. Oh, well. Sorry, guys. I can't remember who did it with. Marcus <laughs> but, Alexander Bagwell. No, not not the tag team with who did no, the no. DVD set with. I know, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Trying to rib me like that. So I what corrected you, you about being a straight man. Yes, yes. What did you think of of Bagwell? Not now, but at that point, what did you think of Bagwell? Again, we clicked. Again, it was when we got in the ring, it was good. Um, I mean, Marcus was making six figures at the time. I was making six hundred bucks a week, sleeping on Ray Lloyd's couch. And the long, long short of it was on the road, Marcus was helping with most of the expenses. All I had to do was drive. And so we just, again, we were traveling everywhere together. And then after about the first few weeks, and Lexi came, here, here's a part of the story. Sting and Marcus were great friends from being there, working out together and doing some traveling together. Uh, Lex came in that first Nitro, and so Lex and Sting were great friends. They owned the gym together in Atlanta, and here I am becoming Marcus's partner. 
so by laws of physics or whatever you want to call it, I end up traveling with Lex, Sting, Marcus, and I'm a four week new newbie, greenhorn, whatever you want to call me, of the in the company traveling with the two top guys of the company and Marcus, who was a top guy but not on their level yet. And so that just became, we became a force. We played golf together. We worked out together. We traveled together. We ate together. We went out and had drinks together, whole nine yards. We, every now and then, either Lex or Marcus, or not Marcus, but uh, Stinger would have a barbecue or something. We'd go to their houses and have some food with the families and stuff like that. So it was a very cool time for me. Again, I was nobody. And here I am traveling with these guys and they also, and me and Marcus would go out. And if we had a weekend off, we'd be hitting Buckhead together. Or we hit the gym, and he called me up. Hey, you, when are you going to be at the gym? I'm going to be there at 2. Meet me there. Let's work out together. And then we'd have a bite to eat. We'd hang out. We were hanging out. We were doing all kinds of stuff. And so we just instantly became friends. So I love Marcus Death. Still on the day. So, I mean, it's we still keep in touch. And so, it's, yeah, it's a cool time. It was definitely, and I think that really helped the chemistry. Because, again, I don't know how much Marcus and Del Wilkes hung out whether they traveled together. I think they probably did a little bit here and there. I know him and Scorpio didn't really hang out together. They were just two different people. And Alex hung out with us a bunch when we traveled together. Sometimes Alex would ride with us if Flex and Sting weren't with us or whatever. Um, but Alex would always join us at the gym too. So there were some guys that, you know, we instantly bonded. I remember the first night after that Nitro, we were in Minneapolis at the, at the Marriott there. It was Lex, Sting, Johnny B. Bad, Alex, Marcus, and I think myself. There might have been one other person there. Um, and I, again, I'm this new guy, and I'm sitting with all these top stars getting a bite to eat after the show. So as goofy as that sounds, you know, this was 95. In 91, 92, probably 92, I think it was, um, I'd actually gotten Sting's autograph at the Omni the night Vader broke his ribs in the match. And so whenever that was 91, 92, I actually gotten Sting's autograph when I was playing college football at the time. And we had left, uh, we left Carlton, drove over there, uh, went to the watch the show, and was, I was hanging out by the back. I was a good-sized kid, and I would always kind of act like I belonged. And somehow was able to hang out a little bit core towards the dressing room. Sting walked by. Hey, Stinger, hey, autograph, signed it for me. I actually told him that one time. And he looked at me and goes, you should never have told me that. The next thing I know, I had people walk up left and right from the Steiners, Lex, Flair. Hey, want my autograph? Hey, want my autograph? <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> so it was a big rib for the longest time. Everybody in the world was kept walking up to me. Want my autograph? Want my autograph? So Sting kind of ripped me with it, but it was one of those things where you're like, dude, I'm I'm with these guys. I'm going to at least have fun when I can. With Buff, I know you say you're still friendly with him today. Why do you think you know he has a bad reputation from some people in the business? Well, Mark's a very uh, I don't want to speak for him all the time, or, you know, whatever. I mean, I've had a lot of people ask me, why does Mark do this? Why does Mark do that? So like, because that's Mark. That's Marcus. Um, he doesn't mind speaking his mind he'll tell you exactly what's going on if he's happy he's happy if he's pissed he's pissed he'll let you know and he kind of learned a little wcw was very political back then um and and i know that uh he was sometimes especially when he became buff he would sometimes come in and argue how a finish was supposed to go argue change the finish and he just became a little bit more looking out for buff you know looking out for marcus and you had to do that at times. Just like I wish I would have learned a little bit more about that uh, to prepare, be prepared for it, to kind of stick up for myself instead of doing something I didn't really want to do. The only time I really stood up for myself and had people applaud me for it was um, we were in Fort Myers, Florida. I think it was somewhere down opposite of Miami and Florida. And uh, Terry Taylor was booking. And me and Terry never got along. Terry comes up to me and says, hey, we want you to work with this kid. It was, a, it was, a, he was there to do a job, basically. 
Um, we want you to work with him and have him go over on you in a dark match. I'm like, why? He goes, well, he's working Scott Hall on TV for a Saturday night, and we want the people in the building to at least think if he beats you, he might be able to beat Scott Hall. I went, that's just a load of crap. Nah, I ain't doing that. What do you mean you ain't doing it? I ain't doing it. And Terry's like, was well, this your hometown or something? You can't lose in your hometown? I'm like, no, that's stupid. If he beats me and he still steps in with Scott Hall, if I step the ring with Scott Hall, nobody's going to think I'm going to beat Scott Hall. So I was part of the flock at the time. At least I think I was. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I just gotten out of it. But I said, no, that makes no sense. There's no psychology to it. And Terry was pissed. Walked out of the booking room and said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, find somebody else who's going to do that. Not me. I walked out about 20 minutes later. Uh, Nick Patrick, Kevin Sullivan, and Arn Anderson walk up to me. I'm thinking, they're going to make me do this match. And they walked up and said, bravo. Way to tell him to fuck off. Whoops, sorry. Um, way to tell him that, you know, that you weren't going to do it. Because we, we, we told him we didn't want you to do it. He kept saying, Riggs has got to do it. Riggs has got to do it. It's got to be him. And we, I just had, I've had heat with him over a couple different things that had nothing to do with wrestling. So, yeah. <laughs> so, whether we hear a chick or an airplane seat was where I got my biggest heat with him. <laughs> so, uh, it was just one of those things where I finally stood up and said, no, nah, I'm not doing that. And that's the way it went. And so, um, when it comes to Marcus, that's the way Marcus was. Marcus started picking up for himself a little more. Started saying, no, I didn't want to do this. No, I didn't want to do that. We're going to do it this way. Or we'll do it that way. Do you think so it's just the way he, it was then? You think that he could have been world champion? Because it seems like he had all the tools and the charisma and everything else. I don't know about world champion. I, I mean, again, you'd have to ask him that question. I'm sure he'd probably say, yeah, he could have been. But that was an entirely different level. And if you were back there, you could see who were the top guys that could be world champion? It was a Sting or a Luger, Hogan, Giant, you know, Nash. But really, there was really nobody at Flair. You know, those those top guys that had been around a while would have wanted to really work with you and do you the same way. And the only time I knew that Flair had a little bit more of a respect for me was one match that uh, we were working in. It was... For worldwide, I think. And it was in Orlando. It was a afternoon taping. And me and him were working. And who was going over to figure four. And I said, Rick, can we can I give you an idea for maybe going into how you want to work the figure four? He goes, What you want to do? I told him, you know, this, that, and the other, start a little comeback. Go, I hit, you know, I duck something from you, I hit you with a forearm, take a bump by the ropes, so I'll cover you, you put your foot in the rope. Um, I'll go to the opposite corner, get on the top, go like I'm going to, you know, do like a cross body wall off your whatever, do something on the top. But you come up holding your face, staggering to the ropes. I'll lose my balance at the top, leg whip my leg over the top rope, drop in the ring, and put the figure four on me. Rick goes, we'll do it. I love it. I went, wow. Rick is taking, here's Rick Flair, world champion, right. Tokyo Dome, Korea made your headline pay-per-views and he took my idea how to go into a finish. And I think that was the match. We started off. He actually shook my hand at the start of it, which kind of blew my mind that Rick, you know, Rick's doing his thing. He sticks out his hand, shake your hand. I'm going, okay. He, he went, shake it, <laughs> shook his hand. And just kind of gave that little respect vibe. Yeah. And we get Flair to do that. It's really cool. He had me slam him off the top. I think that match too. And, and we were going to the, a whole bunch of stuff that he was doing with the other guys. He started doing with me because I worked a couple matches with him before where he didn't give me all the big spots, the sign off the top, the figure four, small package, the backslide, all the things that he do with the other guys. Um, and then when we did the leg whip thing, he had Miss Liz and Nancy was out the by ringside with him. And they didn't know how it was going into the finish. Nick Patrick didn't know. He knew the figure four was the finish, but he didn't know how we were going into it. And when I did the leg whip thing, 
It looks so good. Nick popped down. You okay? If you're watching the tape, Liz and Liz and Nancy are like, hmm. and they look at each other and they all popped on it, which is cool. When you get those veterans, Liz, Nancy, and Nick Patrick popping on what you're doing, you know you did a pretty good job. And when, when Fred did that for you, so if you were going to be a world champion back then, you really want to have to have those guys say, yeah, we want to do that. If they were going to do that with them, a flair or uh, I don't think they could have done it with anybody else. Other than maybe a flair or somebody who could have pulled Marcus and do for Marcus like he did for Sting and like he did for Luger, and like he did for you know Steamboat, groom him, prepare him to be the next guy. Because nobody else could get in there and work with him that way. He could have a match with Nash, but it would be a totally different match. He could have a match with Goldberg, but it would be an entirely different match. Even with DDP, it would be an entirely different match than to prepare Marcus for that next step. And they just never did that with Marcus for the whole time he was there to prepare him to be a champ. So he might have had all the X, Y, and Z factors, but he didn't have A, B, and C start to get to the finish, if that makes sense. That's the way they did it back then. To even, well, even in the 90s, they groom you, prepare you. He would have had maybe, a, if they were going to do that with him, they would have um, put a TV strap on him. I mean, we had an idea um, of me after Mark turned on me to elevate me a little bit more. We gave him the idea to put the TV strap on me. And, like, I would upset Regal on the Nitro. That way, I would have a, a title for me and Marcus to go into sold out with. And the title with me on the line, it sold out. And he would go over on me. And we came up with this finish in the hotel room that night, the Blockbuster. And it's incredible to see how it's changed and morphed and how guys have made it even bigger than it was then. Yep. Uh, that we had, made, we had come up with that bouncing off the bed from one bed to the other when Marcus doing that is how he came up with that finish. But, um, and then going into the, uh, uncensored pay-per-view was when we would have him beat me for the strap in the strap match. We had gained that in my idea and that would elevate me a little bit in the fans eyes. Cause I knew I was going to be putting him over, but it would give me a rub and then put TV strap on Marcus and give him a rub with his first singles title. No, nah, we don't want to do that. Okay. So they didn't put a single side on Marcus. They could have put the U.S. title on him. They didn't want, I guess nobody wanted to do that. They put uh, the tag team strap on him again with uh, Shane Douglas, I think. Or maybe it was Norton. But as soon as he's gotten to his, his singles, as buff, they put him with Norton as a tag team. And then they put him with Shane Douglas as a tag team. So instead of being the single star like we both had hoped he would turn into, in WCW, they just put him right back and tag him again. Yeah. So if they would have made want to make him champ like anybody else, they would have groomed him. They would have started grooming him then. And they just didn't have the plans that way. It was not part of the politics of WCW at the time. So what did you think about the breakup of the American males? He becomes buff. You guys have your little feud there. What did you think about the breakup of the team? I thought, well, when the, we were, a lot of stuff happens in Florida. Um, we were in Tampa uh, for a nitro, and me and Marcus had been doing the fumbling, bumbling, stumbling stuff, called each other either lose, win, or whatever. And um, Marcus was supposed to work with Regal that night and put Regal over for me doing a stumble, fumble with him. And, uh, that's when they were doing the NWO, you know, 90, 30 days, whatever, for anybody who wants to, you know, join us. And Nash and Bagwell have been friends for a long time. And when Nash was, I think he was doing either the Vinny Vegas thing or doing the Oz thing, Marcus and him were traveling, and Marcus was making more money than he was. And again, same thing with me. Marcus was helping put the bill on the road. And so now Nash was going to help pay him back. And Nash said, we're going to make you, he pulled us aside that night and said, uh, Scotty, just be your team member here. I'm like, do whatever you need. He goes, we're going to turn Marcus tonight and have him join the NWO. So we're not doing that match. So Nash came in, pulled a favor and got Marcus to join him that night. It was the first guy. So in my, in my eyes, me and Mark are friends. I mean, Mark kind of talked about it. I'm like, dude, 
this is good for you to finally break out of being a tag team guy. So, yeah, I'm here to help you. I mean, it's, it'll be a road for me, too, because it'll, it'll keep me involved in something, too. It'll give me storyline for the next few months, however it is, however, whatever they want to do with us. And it was good. And that it was funny. It was right after that sold out. We went to Japan for three weeks right after that for our first tour of Japan. And for the first part of it, um, they had a few matches with, uh, I don't think they ever put it together, but Marcus was in American Male stuff for like the first week. And then after that, he had his NWO stuff because they were like a week behind. And then for the last two weeks, he was NWO Japan. So it was kind of goofy how things were a little bit behind there. So they had to kind of sell he was still in American Male. And then after they saw the turn on TV and stuff there is when they, uh, he could wear his other gear. And then we also did a, uh, trying to remember when we did that. We did a Germany tour about the same time. I can't remember. I, I think I'm, maybe I'm overthinking some, but we, when we did a tour of Germany and they were like the same, same thing. Cause it was 97 when they did the NWA thing. I can't remember too many chair shots. <laughs> but yeah, there was stuff that there there were matches. I remember um, maybe that was when we were just doing the stumbling, fumbling stuff. They had us do it in the Germany tour too, but we, it wouldn't cause us to lose because we were working public enemy the whole time. So, but yeah, you know, Marcus could have could have had a great run as a singles if they wanted to push him that way, but the officers didn't want to push him that way. Now, eventually, after that feud's over, you start a feud with Raven a little bit down the road. And then eventually, you and Raven have your feud. He ends up beating you via cheating with help from the flock, and they kidnap you. What did you kind of think of this whole angle? Is Raven your buddy? Was Raven trying to you know, get you back in, in the motion and get give you, you know, a bit of a push? Well, I mean, well, me and Raven have been friends since... We met on some indies and in maybe I think it was 94. Oh, wow. Just cut up talking. He was, he was Flamingo then. And um, just cut up, just, you know, nothing major. And then when he came into WCW, when we did that, in, it was in San Diego. When we did the, the drop toll in the chair, it was just supposed to be a, an impactful way of debuting Raven. And I just remember... It was either my selling that did that that made Kevin sell a light go off in Kevin Sullivan's head. He was like to make a story out of this instead of just a one time thing where I got hurt and was off the road for a while or whatever, didn't get seen and come back and whatever. They turned it into a storyline because it was supposed to be a one off where I got hurt. And then we started working the storyline out of it. I think either Kevin and Scotty talked and said, let's make a story out of this. Cause it'd be a better way to just uh, introduce him and just hurt guy here, hurt guy there, do this here, do that there and make a story out of it. Cause he was putting together a flock and he didn't want me to be a part of the flock at first. Cause I was a retread of the American males. He wanted new guys like Lodi Kidman was a so, so where he, you know, made him come in there. He had sick boy come in. Who was another guy from the power plant. Uh, Saturn came in from ECW, so he was kind of happy about Saturn coming in because he wasn't, he was new to WCW, but he wasn't new to the wrestling world. So there were little things that, um, where he wanted to create the group, but me wearing the eye patch, and this is how we produced our own segments, and since how we produced our own matches back then. When I worked with Saturn, I came out with the eye patch on, and if you can remember the match with Saturn, the eye patches, the gauze and stuff came off, and so they were they were freaking out because they didn't know that I had the eye, the opaque contact lens in. That made me look up you know, the old Jake Snake with the eye yep. patch, you know, the thing made your eyeball white, and they didn't know they had done that. So the, the guys in the back, the Booker and and Bischoff and all those guys had no clue that I was prepared to do this thing and something happened to the eye patch. And when they looked in and saw my eye was messed up, all of a sudden the ref brought by, look at the camera, look at the camera. They love your eye. They love your eye. They want to see your eye. 
So that's when I did the, the dive off the top, too. And Art Anderson didn't want me to do the dive. He goes, dude, you're not Rey Mysterio. You're 240 pounds, and you're like, you're come up probably like a lead weight. He goes, you can do a great drop kick, but I don't know about a dive over a guardrail. And, um, but yeah, we just, we made this, made it work. And we started work, we worked a few house shows together, put our pay per view match together. And it just, again, it was one of those things where it just clicked. Things just worked out. It was timing. Kind of like timing to be back in part of the American Males, get my foot in the door in WCW. And then the click with Raven and the flock just worked. And, and where Raven went, okay, this is going to work with Riggs, even though he's a retread. Um, He's changed his look. He embraced the eye patch. And he's got the hair in the face. He's got the mutt chops going. So this will work. And so, I mean, the, th the funny thing was, is like me and Marcus weren't traveling together as much because he was doing the NWO thing. And there, there were times where he would be on one show, the NWO, we'd be another town over or whatever, another, another part, another, uh, uh, the B towns. He was maybe working an A town loop. We were working B town loop and the flock would be on that. And so the flock started traveling together. So we became a little group that did stuff together. Um, so again, it was just the thing where there was chemistry with Raven, me and Saturn tagged a few times. And we, again, we had chemistry without talking about a whole lot to do this or do that. Got the ring. We just did it. And so I enjoyed the flock because man, it was so cool to sit ringside after they, after we joined, we, you know, we got sit ringside. We sit there and we give fans 20 bucks and bring us a few beers. So we sit there, drink a beer during the show. If we weren't working, um, so you got to watch the matches from a fan's perspective instead of a monitor in the back. And we have real heat. I mean, people walk by, kids would curse at us, flip us the bird. People walk, you know, people sitting around us didn't want us sitting there, we're all mad that we were taking ringside seats and stuff like that. So it was different. It was cool, but we we were like the real the real heels. NWO was the cool heels. We were the guys that got heat. So Good stuff. Plus, the flock was fun. The flock is great, and and it's kind of like that that B squad or whatever. When the NWO is that A squad, as far as like you know the pecking order of things. But was that eye injury legit, or was it just all of, you know work with the eye patch? Yes. What do you mean? Yes. It was a legit injury. Well, it was legit. I couldn't see out of it because I had opaque eye contact. So yeah. I was legit blind in the eye when I wrestled because of the, the the contact lens. Oh, okay, but it wasn't a legit injury though. You never really when I injured right. when I, when I did the drop toe into the chair. This is how I don't know. Maybe this is me protecting the business in one sense, or look the way I viewed the 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 business. Um, I went and got some iodine, and. Basically, just use the iodine, rubbed around my eye, and it made my eye real red. It dried out the skin, so everything kind of went puffy and, and stuff on my eye. And when we got to the airport the next day, because we were in San Diego, and we were we we had stayed that night, we had a flight out the next morning, and um, I'm trying to remember, remember, we had a TV that next morning, or so but I can't remember exactly how that went, but uh. When we got on the, on the flight, I had my sunglasses on, and I took it off, had the eye, all this. And the boys were like, what did you do to your eye? I'm like, dude, I got dropped told into a chair last night, injured my eye. So why not work the gimmick? And a few guys are like, man, that's kind of stupid. I had older guys going, no, that's cool. You, you, that's good. It's like yeah. Ricky Morton when Flair did his thing on him back in the 80s. And he they, they went and sandpapered his eye, got some sandpaper, roughed his eye up, stuff like that, because he had yep. rubbed his eye on the, on the floor. I think they did the same thing with Steamboat, where he actually messed up his eye. You know, and I can't remember who else did something like that, but um, a match somebody had, it was an old school guy, and they actually went to the back, um, and he had him punch him in the eye for, or he either punched himself in the eye to kind of give himself a shiner right. for the next couple of TVs. That's how the guy protected the business back then. So something I did now, and then afterwards, I always wore the the eye, either the eye contact in the airport. 
Uh, of course, when I got home in Atlanta, I didn't really hurt stuff like that. I just wore shades all the time with their little wraparounds and kept them on. You know, sometimes you work them. Sometimes you just act like yourself. But back then, you still kind of protected what you were doing. So if I was seen out, I was an asshole to people. Didn't sign autographs. No, it's rigs to flock. We don't we don't sign autographs. Or if I did it be one for the whole group, I signed one and walk away. Hey, what about us? You know, keep going. And be the bad guy. You didn't want to be like that, you know, if you were being a bad guy then. When we me and Sadder worked uh Mongo McMichael and Benoit at the Georgia Dome and on one of the nights with them. And we went over and instead of just walking behind the, the big set and stuff like that down, down the right way down the aisle uh van hammer watches through the crowd to go up to the top take the elevator down to the dressing room area like we had come in and uh man we were it was a slug fest fans were punching us because we had cheated beat benoit i think raven slugged him give him a ddt so we I, we were actually punching people Wow. To fly all the way up the stairs, and I think we were fighting our way to get out of there. We had heat. <laughs> if the NWO would have done that to somebody and they would have walked off, they could have been doing this number, yay! And the fans were going, yeah, yeah, you know, back at them. They wouldn't have had the heat like that. That's, I think that's just why I enjoyed it so much because we were real villains. We had real, real hate going. It was that was cool. It was fun to be hated. So your last match in WCW was sometime in 99 against Benoit, and then you were released. Was that a surprise? Like that was the last match, or you knew you were? It was a little bit of a surprise, because I had actually sat down with JJ, who was doing the contracts then, and um, I was just finishing up a three-year deal with a pay raise every year, got a nice nice little thing going, and we had sat down, and they had just started doing a whole bunch of you know, firing these guys because they had when I when I got my contract in '96 when I got my first contract, there was 47 people under contract. When I was when I finished up in '99, I think it was like 220. Holy moly! Nitro girls, wow! Everybody, there were guys that had a contract that never worked. Um, uh, Randy Savage's brother, Lanny. Had a contract yeah. and never showed up on the TV, never did anything. Um, there were a lot of guys that were like that because Bischoff went and signed everybody in the world that they didn't want to go to Vince. Kind of like Vince did for a while there because of AEW. Yep. So I had sat down. We had kind of worked on the guys, an outline of a new contract. It would have been a one-year deal with another little pay raise to go in for another one, one more year. And it was maybe about three weeks after we had our first little meeting. They called me over to the CNN Center and said, uh, you know, we want to pull the option and for the contract and want to put you on a nightly deal where we'll sign you to make, you know, a couple grand a match. Maybe you'll work once or twice a week. Maybe it might not work. And I went, nah, wow, I'm out of here. Not good. But yeah. I didn't like the way Vince Russo was booking things. Everybody was walking on eggshells back then because all of a sudden standards and practices became a reality where they didn't want you to do this. They didn't want you to say that. It just become, instead of being fun to be at a TV taping, to be at a Nitro, it became a job. And when you become a wrestler, you don't do it to be a job. You do it because you don't want to work a job. Right. You know? Yep. I don't know yep. how many guys have told you that, but most of the veterans said, man, I wrestled because I didn't want to, I didn't want to have a job. I want to have fun while I was doing. When you right. get in that ring, it's fun. When you get in the on the road, you're having fun. When and, and your every day is different. You know, you're not going to an office. You're not doing a uh, going to a restaurant to work or something like that. It's it's fun. It's it's not a job, and it just became tedious being there, and it was no more fun, and it was just it was a breath of fresh air to get out of there. I was actually when when they pulled the contract and said you know, we're going to do a nightly, I was went, I'm done. I'm out. And so basically they said, okay. And that, I think the Benoit match was in November when it got taped and it might've aired like the first week of December. And I was, didn't, didn't, I mean, didn't call me in for nothing. I basically sat home, watched TV, worked out. Um, and I still had checks coming in 
through the end of January. So basically for two months, you know, 10 weeks, I didn't really do anything because they, they didn't book me on anything. They knew I was finished up. They didn't book me to, to, to lose anybody. It kind of figured, well, I, in, in, w, in USWA, I left on a Wednesday without giving them a two-week notice. Here, I had 10 weeks where they didn't bring me in to even put people over. So I was kind of like, I was happy. Yeah, that's It's good to get out of there. I kept making my nice little paychecks. It was just good to get out because I was just, I was actually happy not being, not having to go to that stuff because it was just miserable how they, how Russo had kind of turned things around to be, uh, what do you call it, crash TV or something like that where everything was this, it was that. Yep. I was like, they had me in Bagwell when they were trying to see if Bagwell was going to be that it guy or whatever. It was all the time it was going to be Jeff Jarrett. Yep. Um, where uh, they they shot a, a kid cam or whatever that thing. It was supposed to be like a hidden camera thing with me and Bagwell were discussing the finish. And I, Bagwell didn't want to put me over and all that kind of stuff. And I hated to do that. I was like, man, I don't want to do this. And they were like, hey, just do it. It's just TV now. It's not wrestling anymore. Because I didn't want to sit there and be saying, yeah, they gave me the finish as a finish. And Marcus going, I don't want to put you over. Well, that's what they gave me. And then they have the referee in the ring touching his ear. I, that was the most embarrassing match of my life. And I owe that to Vince Russo because I hated that match. because It was basically just exposing the business before it was really still exposed. People had an idea, had a clue, but they didn't have the boys telling you. Know, you know, during TV, that this is what's going on. I was like, I was, that's when I should have politically spoke up and said, I'm not doing this. If I would have sent me home, fired me or whatever then, but I just, but I was told just do it. It's not wrestling anymore. It's TV. So I said, okay. How'd you it was up, what it was. How'd you end up at ECW? I love you bringing back the clap, you know, <laughs> and, and, and bringing that back. Was it because um, of RVD, your buddy? Well, the funny thing was, like, me and Rob had met in 93-ish, working some independence, and took a liking to each other. And he was living in Savannah when I was living in Atlanta. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. When I would come home and see my mom and dad, um, Rob lived, you know, a couple miles from them. I would see mom and dad for a couple hours, eat a meal, and i go hang out with Rob. And then i come back home, have another meal, da 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 sleep, this, that, and the other, go hang out with Rob. And that's how we became friends. It's him living in Savannah. And they started getting booked on shows. And when ECW came around, they were actually came into Atlanta. I want to say during that January, uh, when I was still collecting a check from WCW, they came to center stage. And I just went to watch the matches, say hello to the guys, everything else. And um, there were a lot of guys that were like, I guess, looking for work then. Looking to see what was going on. And I saw the guys and Tommy Dreamer. I'd actually really met Tommy in 95 um, at a weekend off. It was me. It was uh, when me and Marcus were still tag champs. And I called up Rob and, and Rob was like, hey, come up to Philly for the weekend. We got a show at the ECW Arena. Come check it out. And it was the weekend where Kimono Wanalea did a dance on top of the stage. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah, those holes in the walls. What I was an eyeball at one of those holes in the in the, <laughs> uh, the sheetrock in the back there, which is up on that the top of the thing. But uh, yeah, I came in there, and that's when I met like Blue Mini, Carino, all the guys that were there, and and Tommy. We had actually met Rob with the Marriott, the airport there, and I met Heyman for the first time, and met Dreamer. We all had a little meal. We chit chatted, got to know each other a little bit, laugh, cut up. You know, I was, you know, in WCW, just starting there in 95, and was one of the tag champs. So we just basically touched base, became friends, kept in contact a little bit. And then in 99, or actually it was 2000, um, because it was January 2000, I just had gone by, just watched the show, and that's when Dreamer walks up to me and says, uh, so when you want to start? I said, excuse me? He goes, got a couple ideas and you being here kind of just gave us some ideas, maybe putting you together, this, that, and the other. He was when you want to start. And I told him, well, when you want me to start? He goes, well, we can do this, this, and this. And that's kind of how it went. Just that easy, huh? It, well, I don't think, again, to me, 
my career was time is basically put were timing where you know when i first started um and i just started doing stuff with with wc i was working independence i met ddp at the main event fitness and I was, like one of the guys promoting the show had a ring in the back of his karate school so instead of going on down to the power plant which was on the south side of atlanta by the airport all the guys lived on the north side of marietta I said, why don't we go to my friend's karate school? So DDP, Steve Regal, Jake the Snake, Brad Armstrong, they all met at the karate school, and I come in there, and I'm just being basically a tackling dummy for DDP to work some spots, work some matches, um, to help him put some stuff together. And so here I am with these top guys. Again, Regal, Jake the Snake, and Brad Armstrong. Regal helped help me with lockups or chain stuff while he's still working with Paige. He was like working with me a little bit. Jake Snake would say, Hey, instead of doing this kid, do this when, you know, to help set him up. So Jake was working on, you know, how to put a match together and Brad Armstrong, all props to him worked me on timing of a drop kick. Okay. I had a good spring, but my timing wasn't always perfect. So he took time to work it with me on my drop kick. So again, it's a timing thing. Meeting those guys in WCW. And then we went down to the power plant to do the match, me and Paige, to show Jody Hamilton um, a match. So we worked the match. Jody Hamilton, who are you? And Paige says, this, you know, told me, don't say a word. Says the kid's a year and a half in business, Jody. Jody's like, you want to work some TV? He goes, I, I, he goes, I book all the TV, the TV talent. I can put you in good matches because you can work. Okay, so next thing you know, I'm working Regal in a match, in an eight-minute match. Normally, it's a, a five-minute squash match. They put me in a match with him, and Regal, from working with me before the Marietta thing, gave me some good spots in the match. Made me look good. I work a match with Steve Austin for Saturday night. We are supposed to be Sam Houston. Sam doesn't show. Sam's on his way. Briggs, you're out. Sam's not showing up. Briggs, you're back in. Steve keeps walking up. Can you work ahead? Yeah, okay. 20 minutes later, can you work a leg? Yeah, okay. 20 minutes later, can you work an arm? Yeah, okay, ribs. Austin's ribbing me the whole time, back and forth, back and forth. Long story short, I'm having this great match with Steve where he makes me look like a 10-year veteran. Um, Dusty Rhodes, you can cut to me after the match, and Dave Austin goes, baby, I knew the finish, but you and, you and, you and Steve were working so good together. I, you had me at the edge of my feet, baby. And I was like, and when you when you get Dusty come up to you, and you're not but a job guy, basically, an enhancement talent, saying you have a job, that's that's cool. You know, and Steve was like, good, kid, you were there with me, everything. Very good, very good. And it was soon after that was when I got my uh, couple of runs on the road with uh, being the opening match. Me and a guy named Mike Winter were working each other, opening a match for every other weekend for a little bit. We even worked a couple of shows where Sting and, and Flair we uh, worked at, we were like two small towns Friday, Saturday, a Sunday would be a main show and with a flare and sting on top and Anderson and think Roma at the time were against somebody, uh, to the tax, the tax traps. So all of a sudden I'm opening a match at a big show. So, and then timing of R informed me aside to send me to USWA or tell me to get out of there. So USWA opens up because of Jake the snake talking to Jerry Lawler. So then, because of a music video, I did it back well, um, opened the door to be seen by Jimmy Hart to put the American Trails together. Then when Raven coming in, after they kind of didn't know what to do with me, Raven came in, and Kevin Sullivan wanted to put me with Raven to do the eye injury, and then that morphs into a storm. So everything in my life had been just timing, where, where something looked like it would be a little slow, all of a sudden something happened. Be a little slow, something happened. And that was the nature of my career. Even though it wasn't huge, it was something that kept me involved. And it was the same thing in ACW. It was like, I just showed up and it happened to be the right time. And either whether Rob, because I never asked Rob about it, because I'm not going to say, hey, did you say something to the guys about me getting hired? You know, I'm not going to, you know, if he did, I appreciate it, but I'm not going to ask him, you know, because I disrespect him too much. We were too good friends. And so, um, the next thing I said, Tommy walks up and says, when you want to start? Because they were looking to hire a few guys. 
and it opened the door for me. Next thing you know, I'm in ECW. You and RVD had a pretty damn good feud. I liked it. Even, uh, you know, culminating at uh, Heat Wave 2000 was was the big match. But I liked that feud a lot. It was very good. I mean, the coolest part of it was Heyman pulled me aside. I think it was the first time I was at the arena. and it was, I think it was when I carried Rob out of my shoulders. Uh, Paulie pulled me aside and said, hey, this is what I want to do with you over the next six months. I said, okay. He goes, have you and Rob together as friends because you're legit friends. Then I'll have you turn on Rob. Rob will be doing his, the whole effing show thing. And you'll just be my best friend, Scotty. You know, I'm just Rob Van Dam's best friend. Nothing else, just and the whole time commentary. He's Rob Van Dam's best friend, Scotty. You know, Cyrus is saying it. Joey Styles is saying it. And, um, and Paul goes, so we'll do this. And then we got a few things where I'll probably put you with Carino. I'll put you with Cyrus as part of the network. You'd be like a hired guy for him. And he laid out about a six-month plan of what would happen and how it would happen. And he's been the only booker to ever do that with me. To sit down and say, this is what we do in six months. And it happened almost like dominoes falling. It was incredible how Paulie booked it and made it happen exactly like that. And then working with Rob, we have been, like I said, we we worked together in 92-ish. 93 in that time period for about a year and a half we worked shows either tagging together or the booker uh greg price uh would have us wrestle each other as either the main event or but a babyface match you know we, we you know, kind of like him and jerry lynn did at the start but without being so fast and everything else i'm uh, nowhere near as fast as jerry lynn but um but it was that type of style, that type of thing where we, we chain us, we do this, and we end up looking at each other like this type of thing. Yeah. And um, so we, we did that for a year and a half, two years, every other weekend or once a month or two, you know, two, two times a month, depending, depending on how, how booking went. And so we knew each other. We trusted each other. And um, when we got to ECW, it was the same same thing. We, did, we trusted each other. So when I turned on them, it worked. And being put with Cyrus got me some good heat. Yes. Because uh, Cyrus could really cut a promo, could really talk. It was great. He knew how to do it. And then working with Rob was, was a blast. I had a blast working with him. Broke my nose again, but that was cool. <laughs> um, he broke it in Kansas City, actually, on a house show when we were working the Grand Terminator into the matches. We wanted to see how it went. And I protected my face the first time like this. So had my hands up, and when he hit it, he hit it like this, and the chair went like this, and the the the, the senior chair went bonk, right in my nose. See that little quirk right there? Yep. Thanks, Rob. That's Rob, and um, you know, on the pay per view, I did this. <laughs> so well, he might break my arm, but he's not gonna break my nose again. <laughs> so uh, I kind of wish he would have done that because when when the, the <laughs> Uh, Carino and Victor are running out to uh, interfere in the match, so we didn't really have a finish at the house show. And but when the, the chair hit, all of a sudden, this bright, bright light flash, all of a sudden, it was dark, I opened my eyes, and all of a sudden, it was red from all the blood. And I crawled out of the ring with blood just pouring out of my nose, and that would have been so perfect on the pay per view. Right. You know, see my face just explode at the first time the Van Terminator is seen on pay-per-view, you know, that type of thing. But instead, I protected my face, and I went to the uh, uh, the lip dish rag where I just where, like, it knocked me out. And I can remember if you saw Rob, when he grabbed my leg, he pulled me, and my whole body went flop. <laughs> and I just kind of went, okay. I'm just, I just kind of just, just breathed, just closed my eyes and breathed, and just... I don't know how I did it, but instead of being like stiff and, and make the arm flop over or whatever, it just happened. And it looked like he knocked me out. So that just got over just as good. I love it. Now, as we hit the wind down, head towards the finish, any regrets in the business? Anything you, you didn't get the chance to do, you wish you got the chance to do? The only thing, the guy who trained me was Ted Allen. Um, he worked with Arn Anderson, big boss man. Um, he helped train the referee, Randy Anderson. 
He'd help train um, Ranger Ross. Oh, yeah. And Ted trained me the old school way of um, we would wrestle each other on, on these shows. I would help, I would drive with them, set the ring up. And in a lot of these shows, we were on opposite sides of the building, good guys and bad guys. If you get in the ring, call the whole match in the ring. And he would always say, he, I like, we, we do a spot, bam, 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 bam. And it with an arm, arm bar on like this and sitting on him. And he goes, you hear how the crowd reaction? That was good. Now let's do something when they, when they shit on it. I'm like, do what? He goes, just follow me. And we do something, bang, bang, bang. And it just the crowd, would, we're just like, uh. He goes, you hear that? He goes, learn, to do, learn the difference of how to do a spot, when to do a spot. And that's how he trained me. And that's how I knew how better to work. But I never really learned how to develop a character, a persona. I was American males or I was the eye patch and the flock, which was cool. Did the mirror gimmick, kind of got back to the to the the, the clap thing and ECW, and we'd actually had plans that had been around a little bit longer, where they would have turned me babyface, and they were like, you could have been like Al Snow with the head with the mannequin things. He goes, could you imagine the ECW crowd doing this? He goes, that would have been huge because they even when I first came in, they didn't like me, and they were like. <laughs> How, how they, they'd be cursing me going, Riggs, you suck. American males suck, but we're glad you're here. It was the kind of reaction, especially in Philly and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the best heat I got was a match with Steve Carino, where I turned Carino babyface. And it was we're setting him up to end up being the, the ECW champ. We did a match, and I remember Paul Lee pulled me aside and said, Steve needs to work a high-paced Nitro match. Can you do that? I said, yeah. So we set the match. It was bang, 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 bang. A good TV match. It was like seven minutes instead of a long ECW-style match. He goes, I just want Steve to get boom, 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 to learn how to work a faster-paced TV match. And we got out there, and I remember we were going back and forth. He'd come out there, and we were yarding each other, and I'm, just, I'm sitting there going, do you hear these fans cheer for you? You some bitches they love, and you know, I'm but I'm telling him, so this is going, we're gonna have a blast, we're gonna have a blast. And he's going, he goes, he's looking at me, going, Damn, thank you for calming me down, thank you for calming me down. And the whole time, we're just pantomiming our Bible, we're sitting and talking to each other like we're having a conversation, like me and you are right now. Yeah, and it was so cool. And the ECW crowd's going bonkers, and it was just, it was great. And it was, you know, the ECW started to develop a character for me that nobody in WCW did and that I really didn't do over time. And the, the best example I have is Rob Van Dam. When he first started doing Van Dam says Zakowski in wrestling and he, he was going to do all Japan and stuff like that. When he first started developing who Rob Van Dam was and the, the, the whole effort show, the thumbs and everything was when he first really developed that character and that persona. And when he got to WWE, he was all prepared and ready. I mean, I look at Marcus. Marcus was Mark Bagwell for three, four, five years in WCW before he became buff. And the last year of the company, the last couple of years of the company took him to where he finally became buff and finally figured out the character and everything. So it took him years to develop who that character was. I, my, my first match was February of 92. And three years later, I'm one half the world tag team champions of August of 95 in WCW. So I really had great time to learn how to work, but never really developed a character, how, who Scotty Riggs was, who, who, whoever ended up being, you know, who Riggs ended up being, never developed that persona of who you could identify that with. That's about the only regret that I have. I wish I would have had a little more time to develop who that could have been. Because again, USWA about how to wrestle, how to carry a match, how the ring work, being a technician. Um, I mean, I, I, that was you know that that was my my thing. I could get in the ring and work with anybody and carry a great match, but the persona that, that the fans could get behind and everything else really wasn't there yet. And then um, after ECW closed down. Ended up going to work for Dusty in his TCW group. 
and pretty much kept the clap gimmick there, the persona that I had built up in kind of an ECW. Dusty wanted me to keep that. So we kind of kept that going on. And I started developing a lot better about who that guy was. But it was still way too late, in a sense, to carry that on somewhere else. Just never developed that, that character yet. That's the only thing I think it, I could have a much longer career and a much higher profile career, probably. Um, for what I had that because that was one thing Jim Ross was like, you know, was saying when I did get hired by WWE, he goes, We don't have anybody that we can identify you with, you, you're not a commodity, you're a great hand, you're a great talent, a great technician, you can get to work with anybody, but. You know, maybe in time, if you develop a little more who you are, that you could sell us who you are, maybe that's when we could hire you. you know, but right now, we, we don't have the time to develop who you could be. All right, cool. I understand that. I respect that because I had that was the one thing I was lacking was who, you know, who Scotty Riggs was. Was the high point the tag title win in WCW? Was that the high point? <sighs> I mean, it's all, it all kind of. Yeah, that was a cool point. But really being a wrestling fan, probably the high point of my career was the first time I went to Japan and got to work to wrestle in a foreign country against guys who didn't speak my the English, you didn't you didn't communicate with, you just kind of wrestled. You just kind of went out there and did stuff. You set up some ideas, some some spots, but a lot of it was just working. And to go to a foreign country with not not part of a tour of you know your your home American company, but to go and face talent you've never worked with before, didn't know you, you didn't know them, that was probably the high point when I was able to go to another country and do that. Because I got to do that a couple times. And then even after WCW, I got to go to Germany and England a couple times and work with guys that I'd never met before. So that was cool. So that was, that was probably more of a high point as being a wrestler. Um, I loved wrestling USWA because it was six nights a week, twice on Saturday, living the life of a pro wrestler on the road, hotel rooms every night, Waffle House every other night, you know, working out in different gyms, uh, learn how to pop a crowd, stuff like that. Learn, you know, that was a blast. Um, being Lex Luger's flag bearer was a high point, but I guess you know if you want to if you want to will it down to go the coolest part of my career was the WCW tag team titles because again, no one who had had actually worn those straps because they were the same straps that you know Steamboat and Shane Douglas wore that Cactus Jack wore with uh, Kevin Sullivan that uh, like I said um, Williams and uh, Gordy, all those teams and you know, the Steiners, all the guys that had held it before me. Those actual straps, those guys are worn, carried to the ring, stuff like that. Those actual straps have been a lot of a waste of some, some of the best talent in the world. So to me, that was the coolest thing, definitely. I went, I've had a lot of high points, but the coolest thing was the straps, yeah. You got anything coming up next? Anything that you're, uh, you're doing or just enjoying retirement? Cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I lived a life that I never thought, like I said, you know, I, I was blessed. With a lot of timing in my life to be a wrestling fan. I started watching wrestling at the same time I became a Cowboys fan, brother. And as you see my cowboy hats right there. Yes. Nice. Um so I became a fan of them at the same time I became, I'm a fan of wrestling. I mean, my dad just goes to the Civic Center every other weekends when NWA Minute Man Championship Wrestling would come and that was be part of the Georgia Championship Wrestling crew too. Um so to actually become a wrestler after, as an eight, nine-year-old kid, uh, we had a, a police officer who lived around us, around the neighborhood, and he was working the the wrestling as security. And so I got to actually get the guys ring jackets and robes and stuff. And so as an eight-year-old kid, I'm getting Ric Flair's robe handed to me. 20 years later, I'm in the ring wrestling Ric Flair calling the finish, setting up the finish. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm wrestling about yep. Nitro. Um, a guy who autographed thing I got, I'm traveling with now, playing golf with. Lex Luger, a guy who was flag bearer in WWF when he wrestled Yokozuna on um, Raw. 
um, I'm now playing golf with, traveling with. So, and then I get to ECW and get to work hardcore. <laughs> and see Kimono Wanalea dance on the stage, you know, all the crazy right. stuff. I mean, a lot of wrestlers had these stories, but to me, I'm, you know, it's, you start off as a fan, you start off sitting in the ring, stuff like that. So you pay your dues a little bit, but yeah, I mean, to be able to get up tomorrow morning and drink coffee and, and know that I got those memories is, is really some of the coolest stuff. So I'm over that part of my life, the sanity. I guess I don't do a whole lot of conventions and stuff. It just, it was part of my life. It was a blast. I was a wrestler, got to live a dream. And now I'm just chill. Keep my expectations low, keep things happy. And as long as I'm waking up every morning, life is good. Where can everybody find you, social media wise and other words? Uh, social media, R- Real Scotty Riggs, just a verified one on Twitter. Luckily, I got that little verification thing on there. That was kind of cool. I had a little agent that worked that out for me a couple years ago. Um, that's pretty much about it. <laughs> you see me talking about my Dallas Cowboys on there. Nice. Putting over some matches I like, stuff like that. I can BS with a few fans and every now and then drop a uh, troll everybody with American Males, you know, GIF or <laughs> drop some, you know, part of the tune on there and, and get people, you know, damn it, that song's in my head now, you know, that type of yep. thing from fans. So that's always, yeah, it worked. Always happens to me. I know that. that song. It's always a blast to make that song get in somebody's head and irk them for the whole day. <laughs> Good stuff. Yes. But Scotty, thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Files, I, I enjoy it, man. It's being on the two man power trip twice now so i'm part of yes. a two man i'm a two i'm a two for on here yes beautiful thing brother beautiful thing i enjoyed it